abdomen. So chapter six was dealing with the physiology of the skeleton. This is what we're discussing here is the anatomy of the skeleton. This is chapter seven. So you can find this information in your textbook in chapter seven, which also is gonna be the lab part. All right, Alaya. All right, so starting now, another bone of the appendicular skeleton this is going to be the scapula and the scapula if you see on here has two processes we've got the this process which is the continuation of a bony ridge on its posterior aspect. This bony ridge here is the spine of the scapula. And the process, which is a continuation of the spine, this is my acromion that articulates with the acromial end of the clavicle, as we've seen earlier. The other process that we see on here, this bony process, it's gonna be the coracoid process. Coracoid process. Where did we hear a word similar to coracoid? Where did we hear a word similar, the cell similar to the coracoid. Remember, coronoid, exactly. What was the coronoid process? Coronoid process, this was the anterior process of the mandible. This is coronoid process. This is a coronoid process. And this here is the scapula. This is my coracoid process. Coracoid process. Coracoid process. Another important marking that we can see here in the scapula is this cavity on the lateral side of the scapula. This is my glenoid cavity. And the glenoid cavity is the site of the articulation of the head of the humerus. So the head of the humerus along with the glenoid cavity of the scapula will form my shoulder joint. So glenoid cavity articulates with the head of the humerus as you see on here. And again, the articulation between glenoid cavity and the head of the humerus is what allows the formation of the shoulder joint. All right. Again, the lab exam is only gonna be consisting of the information that we are discussing in the axial and appendicular skeleton, which is most of chapter seven. So again, the source here for the information for the lab is gonna be those two PowerPoint presentations, as we've mentioned last time. Those are part of chapter seven and only chapter seven. All right, so again, again, what is the name of the bones that we're looking at in here? This is by scapula, important structures that we need to, to know. Here are the scapula. On the dorsal aspect, we've got this bony ridge. 
this bony ridge here in the posterior aspect of the scapula, this is gonna be the spine of the scapula. The continuation of the spine, we have this process. This is my acromion. This here, the continuation of the spine. This is my acromion. And again, what's articulating with the acromion? What is articulating with the acromion is the acromial end of the clip. Another process that we can see on here, this is my coracoid process. Coracoid process, don't confuse. Coronoid, coronoid is the one in the mandible. Coracoid is the one here in my scap. We've seen, we've seen a shallow cavity on the lateral side of the scapula. This is my glenoid cavity. And again, what is articulating with the glenoid cavity is going to be the head of the humerus. Head of the humerus is the one that articulates with my glenoid cavity. Glenoid cavity. Other structures that you can see on here, which are not required from you in the lab, but we're going to need them when we discuss the muscles. You see on here this depression above the spine. We call this is supraspinous fossa, supraspinous fossa. It's not, you don't need to identify the supraspinous fossa for the lab exam, but it's important for us because we're gonna need this information when we discuss the muscles. Also, you can see another bony depression in the posterior aspect of the scapula located below the spine of the scapula. So what do you think we're gonna call this one? Is the superior one is called supraspinous fossa. What do you think we're gonna call the one located below the spine of the scapula? If the one above it is supraspinous, so is this is gonna be infraspinous fossa. Fossa is a depression on here. This depression, this depression below the spine of the scapula is my infraspinous fossa. Questions, questions? All right, so moving on to the bones of the upper limb. So we can see on here. The first bone of the upper limb that you can see is gonna be the humerus. And as you see, and as you see on here, the head of the humerus is articulating with the glenoid cavity, as we mentioned earlier, of the scap. If we're looking closer at the proximal, proximal end 
of the humerus. What we can see, we'll see a prominent bony eminence. Prominent bony eminence on the lateral side opposing to the head of the humerus. So the head of the humerus is directed towards the midline to articulate with the glenoid cavity. On the other side, we've got a large bony eminence on here. This is called my greater tubercle. Greater tubercle is this large bony eminence on the opposing side to the head of the humerus. A much smaller one, much smaller bony eminence that you see on here. This is gonna be my lesser tubercle. So the lesser tubercle on here, it's gonna be located on the anterior aspect of the proximal end of the humerus. So again, again, in the proximal end, we need to identify three main structures. First one is the head of the humerus. On the lateral aspect of the proximal end, we've got the greater tubercle. And and on the anterior aspect, we've got the lesser tuber. Like any head, what is gonna be located below the head? What's gonna be located below the head? What do you think? What's located below your head? Your head, what comes below it? Your neck, so. We call this is my anatomical neck, anatomical neck. It doesn't have like any clinical importance. The anatomical neck here doesn't have any clinical importance. The one that actually has a clinical importance is the connection between the proximal end and the shaft of the humerus. So we call this is my surgical neck. So again, again, the humerus has two necks. We've got the anatomical neck, this groove that is located at the base of the head of the humerus, and we've got the surgical neck on here, which is the connection between the proximal end or the proximal epiphysis and the shaft of the humerus. If we kept moving down, an important marking, what is not required from you for the lab exam, you see here it's not underlined, only the underlined ones are the ones on your list. But don't forget, you need to look at the list because the list is going to contain the information related to the articulation and other stuff. But in terms of identification, all of the ones that are underlined in those PowerPoints, those are the ones which are required from you to know. So in the shaft, in the mid shaft of the humerus, you will see an elevation here in the shaft of the humerus. This is called my deltoid tuberosity. And the deltoid tuberosity is the point of insertion for a muscle that gets its origin from the clavicle and the scapula and would be inserted down here. 
and we call this muscle it's my deltoid muscle so the deltoid muscle when it contracts is going to be pulling your arm away from your body all right so again again what we're looking at in here we're looking at this point of attachment this elevation in the mid shaft of the humerus this is called the deltoid tuberosity again it's not required for you to know for this lab exam but you're going to need it when we study the muscles if we kept moving down to the lower end of the shaft of the humerus or the distal end of the shaft of the humerus the distal epiphysis what can i see on here i will see a rounded articular surface and another articular surface which is cylindrical in shape rounded articular surface this is called my capitulum it looks like a head it looks like a head we call it capitulum like the head of a state or the city that will have the government of the state what do we call it what do we call the city that has the government of the state capital the head of the state capital all right if i'm asking you did you understand what would i say capish capish head if a person take off another person's head this is called decapitation so capit capit capito is head so the rounded structure here in the lower end of the humerus that looks like a head it's called the capitulum capitulum the cylindrical shaped part is called the trochlea trochlea so again again we have two articular surfaces in the lower end of the humerus one is called the capitulum this is rounded and the other one is cylindrically in shape this is the trochlea you notice which one is lateral which one is medial which one is located away from the midline and which one is closer to the midline what do you think is the capitulum lateral or medial it's lateral how about the trochlea is it lateral or medial it's medial it's towards the midline so capitulum on here and trochlea on here what are those two articular surfaces are articulating with they are articulating with the two bones of the forearm the lateral bone articulates with the capitulum the lateral bone here of the forearm is called the radius and the medial bone of the forearm that articulates with the trochlea is called the ulna so again again we have got two articular surfaces in the distal end of the humerus those are my capitulum and my trochlea capitulum articulates with the radius and the trochlea articulates with the ulna
if we're looking at the posterior aspect on here, we'll see a large bony depression in the posterior aspect of the lower end of the humerus. We call this is my olecranon fossa. Olecranon fossa. And the olecranon fossa here, if you see, it's the site for articulation of this large process. See this large process of the ulna? It passes to the inside of the olecranon fossa. We call this is my olecranon process. Olecranon process of the ulna is going to be articulating with this depression in the humerus. Again, what do we call this? The large depression in the posterior aspect of the lower end of the humerus. This is my olecranon fossa. And what do we call the process here of the ulna? This is going to be my olecranon process. Olecranon process. So if we're looking here at the articulations between the lower end of the humerus and the radius and ulna, what you can see, I have three points of articulation. I have the capitulum articulating with the head of the humerus. And I have the trochlea, the cylindrical shaped part. Is going to be articulating with this notch of the ulna. Uh, so what we're looking at in here, this is my ulna, and if you notice, I have a notch in the ulna where the trochlea is going to be articulated. So we call this here, the notch in the ulna is my trochlea notch. And another point of articulation between the radius, ulna, and the humerus is the articulation between this process of the ulna. What do we call it? This is my olecranon process. It articulates with the depression in the back of the humerus. This is my olecranon boss. I can't understand your question, Theodore. Can you explain what do you mean? So again, again how the lower end of the humerus looks like. It has two articular surfaces. One is a sphere, 
looks like a head, and one is a cylindrical shaped articular surface, like this. The capitulum. Articulates with what again? Articulates with the head of the radius. And the trochlea is going to be articulating with the trochlear notch. So this is the rest of the ulna on here. And all this dotted means it's posterior. It's located behind the humerus. So we call this as my true clear notch as it articulates with the true clear of the humerus. What else is a point of articulation? If we're looking here, it's going to be the medial side. This is my trochlea, like this. And I'm looking from the posterior aspect. Above the trochlea on the posterior aspect, I've got this large notch. This is my olecranon fossa. And again, here, this is my ulna. It has its olecranon process that passes to the inside of the olecranon fossa. And it's trochlear notch that articulates with the trochlea. This is the medial aspect. And there is no continuation here for the capitulum on the posterior aspect. So I can see on here on the lateral aspect of the forearm, you can see the radius. This is located like this. All this together is called my elbow joint. So the elbow joint is actually formed of two joints articulation between capitulum and the head of the, of the radius, and the articulation between the trochlea and the trochlear notch of the ulna. Yeah, the olecranon process as it passes, so if you flex your elbow joint, you see this protruding part, this is the olecranon process. If you keep touching it while you are extending your forearm, you're gonna see that it disappears. It passes to the inside of the olecranon fossa. You can go to a hyperextension. I can't perform, I, so I can't move my forearm beyond this point. I can't perform a hyperextension. I can't allow any further extension because simply the olecranon fossa, as you're saying here, it's going to be passing to the inside of the olecranon fossa, preventing any further extension to take place. All right, so you can only flex in one side, but you can flex your elbow on the other side. You can't flip to the other side, exactly. For Alexandra, so electronal process is what makes our elbow. So the elbow joint, the elbow joint is an articulation between two things in the lower end of the humerus and the two bones of the forearm. Capitulum articulates with the head of the radius. Trochlea articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna. If you are saying the, if you mean by the elbow, is this pointed part? Yes, this pointed part of the elbow on here, 
is going to be the olecranon process, this protruding part. All right, does this answer your question? All right. Any, any questions? Any questions? Any questions? All right, so let's move on to the two bones of the forearm. What are the two bones of the forearm? We've got on the lateral side, on the lateral side of the forearm, I've got the radius. On the medial side, I've got the ulna. Lateral side, radius. Medial side, ulna. Radius, ulna. Radius, ulna. Again, what is the radius is articulating with up in here? It articulates with the capitulum. And what is the ulna is articulating with here? Is this is going to be my trochlea. So another thing that we need to know in the lower end of the humerus. Remember, what do we call the articular surfaces? What do we call the articular surfaces of the mandible that will allow its articulation with the temporal bone? What do we call? Yeah, condyles, mandibular condyles. And what did we call the ones in the occipital bones that will allow the articulation between the skull and C1? You remember, those are occipital condyles. So generally speaking, generally speaking, articular surfaces here that are convex, we call them condyles, but here we give them specific names, rather than condyles. But I have bony eminences above the capitulum and the trochea. So I would call this, those bony eminences, the bony eminences above the articular surface. So I call them epi, epi means above, like epidermis. But here they are above the articular surfaces, which are the capitulum and the trochea, but we don't call them epicapitulum and epitrochea. We call them above the articular surfaces generally generally speaking, so we call them epicondyles. So the one on the same side as the trochlea, this is gonna be my medial epicondyle, and the one on the same side as the capitulum is gonna be my lateral epicondyle. All right, so again, again, what we're looking at in here is this bony eminence above the trochlea and above the capitch. So what do we call the one above the trochlea? This is my medial epicondyle. What do we call the one above the capitulum? This is my lateral lateral epicondyle. So we've got again, medial epicondyle above the trochlea and lateral epicondyle above the capitulum. Moving on to the radius, which is the lateral bone of the forearm. Very few markings that we need to remember here for the radius, because the first thing is gonna be the head of the radius, head of the radius. Below the head, we've got neck of the radius. And if we kept moving down, we're gonna see a pointed bony process This is gonna be the styloid process of the radius. Where did we hear styloid process before? Can you remind me in which bone did I see styloid process? What bone did I have styloid process? 
in the temporal bone. Remember, styloid and mastoid. Styloid and mastoid. So here I've got another styloid process in the radius. So in order to not get confused between which styloid process is which, so if I just mention styloid process, I mean the one in the temporal bone. If I want to mention the styloid process uh, of the radius, I would just mention it like it is. I would mention styloid process of the radius. Styloid process of the radius. If I just kept it non-specific, if I just kept it non-specific, I mean by the styloid process is the one in the temporal bone. Another set of markings here that would be related to the ulna. Remember this process that passes in the large notch in the posterior aspect of the lower end of the humerus. This is my olecranon process. Olecranon process. We've got a large notch that articulates with the trochlea. We call this large notch that articulates with the trochlea is my trochlear notch. Trochlear notch. If I kept moving down to the lower end, of the ulna, I will see another pointed bony process. This is gonna be another styloid process, but this time it's gonna be the styloid process of the ulna. Again, if I kept it non-specific, I mean by this the styloid process, if I kept it non-specific, the one in the temporal All right. Questions, questions. Moving on to the bones of the hand. We have three sets of bones related to or forming the hand. We've got the bones that share in the formation of the wrist. Those are called by carpal bones. And then I've got those five bones that would be connecting the carpal bones to the bones of the fingers, the bandages. Those are my metacarpal bones. And I have the phalanges. I have proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, and distal phalanx. This will be applied to all the medial four fingers. But for the thumb, I don't have a middle phalanx. I have only a proximal phalanx and the distal phalanx. So all the medial four fingers are going to have proximal, middle, and distal. But for the thumb, only I have a proximal and a distal. I don't have a middle phalanx. Starting first with the carpal bones. We have the mnemonic here. We have a mnemonic here that will tell us the order of those bones, but you need first to make sure that you know how to use those, this mnemonic. 
So the mnemonic here is Sally left the party to take Kathy home. So we're looking here at the carpal bones. We'll see that we have one, two, three, four. This is my proximal row, the row closer to the radius and ulna. And I have another row of carpal bones, also going to be formed of one, two, three, and four carpal bones. So we've got a total of how many carpal bones? We've got a total of eight carpal bones. So, how would we use this mnemonic? We start from lateral from the thumb remember in an anatomical position you are standing up erect your palms are facing forward so the thumb is lateral so i go from lateral or in other words from the thumb i go medially so sally next is going to be i'm starting again by the prox the proximal row then i will go to the distal row every time i start the row i start from lateral to median so i'm going from lateral to median so this is going to be the first one here sally next is going to be left the Part. And then I will go to the distal row here. I start again from lateral to medial to take Kathy home. All right, this is to remind you of the name of the carpal bones. So starting first, S here, this is my scaphoid, scaphoid, scaphoid. Next bone in the proximal row is going to be left here. This is lunate, lunate. The this is going to be triquitral, triquitral, and then I will have this tiny little bone on top of the triquitral. This is my PZ4, PZ4. So, again, again, starting first, Sally left the party to take Kathy home. So we're starting here. Sally is scaphoid left lunate the triquitral and then party is PZ4. PZ4. Then I will go to the distal row. I go to take Kathy home. So I go trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So again, again, what are the bones of the wrist on here? We have eight carpal bones that are arranged into a proximal row and a distal row. We use the mnemonic, Sally left the party to take Katie home, just to remind us of the first letter of each of the bones. All right, so how to use the mnemonic again? Very important. We start from lateral, means from the thumb. And how would I know that this is the thumb? It is the only finger that has a proximal and a distal phalanx. It doesn't have a middle phalanx. So 
starting here, scaphoid, lunate, triquitral, and PZ4. To take Kathy home, so we gotta have here trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So scaphoid, lunate, triquitral, PZ4. Next row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. One trick on here, one trick on here. If you're looking at the posterior aspect of the hand, so how would you identify those bones? Again, you start the same way, you follow the same rules, same exact rules. So where is the lateral side? Right here. This is where I've got the thumb. This is my lateral side. I start which row, the one away from me or the one closer to me? Would I start with the row closer to the radius and ulna or would I start with the row closer to the metacarpal bones? I will start with the one closer to me, the radius and ulna. So again, again, we start from which side? This side one or this side two? Which one would you start from? Choose the mnemonic. You start from two, from the thumb, from lateral. So you go, Sally, left, the, but I don't see a party here. Don't see party. See on here, I've got scaphoid, lunate, triquitral, but I don't see pisiform. Why? Because the pisiform appears only from an anterior view. So this is a tricky part on here. When we're looking at the posterior aspect, we're gonna follow the same exact rules. You start from the proximal row, but the proximal row will show only three bones rather than four. So Sally left the party, no party, no party from the posterior view. I can't see the PZ form. PZ form is gonna be appearing from an interior view on. And then we go to the distal row. We're gonna go the same order. You start from lateral, from the thumb, go immediately towards the little finger. So we go to trapezium, take trapezoid, capi is ca capitate. And finally, home hamid. So again, again, from a posterior view, you will see only seven carpal bones instead of eight. Why? Because the PZ form appears in the anterior surface. Questions, questions? Questions?